speaking with Professor Philip Sharp, Institute Professor at the Koch Institute at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and 1993 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. Thanks for joining me today, Phil. Oh, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. I spent a few years of my life working on the same floor as you. Down the hall in Dave Baltimore's lab. We, uh, we even have a paper together. We probably do. With uh, Ihor Lemishka. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, right. yes, yes. So this uh, chat we're going to have is for our virology textbook. Each chapter has a different subject. And yours is RNA processing. So that's what we're going to be chatting a little bit about today. But before we do that, I want, uh, wonder if you can give us a little idea about where you were born and raised and educated. Uh, yes, I was uh, born in Kentucky. Uh, the family was uh, at first a tenant farmer and then bought a farm when I was eight. And I lived on that farm until I was 18 and made enough money uh, farming uh, to pay for one year college. So uh, I went to a college in Union, uh, Union College in Barberville, Kentucky, a small school, mm -hmm. uh, and majored in chemistry and mathematics. Uh, really fell in love with science. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to the University of Illinois to uh, mm -hmm. get my PhD in chemistry. The problem was when I went to Illinois, uh, took the qualifying or entrance exams for the chemistry graduate program, I flunked three out of the four. <laughs> uh, I just had never seen the material. It, had, it was uh, very, uh, well, it was newer material. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did exactly the right thing. Uh, they told me to go take the senior classes at the University of Illinois. And three years later, I got my PhD. And then I went to Caltech uh, to do my postdoc with Norman Davison, where I learned electron microscopy and mm -hmm. I worked with uh, bacterial factors and fertility and drug resistant factors in bacteria. Had a great postdoc. But I wanted to learn how to use viruses to probe mm -hmm. the molecular processes in mammalian cells and to uh, uh, study the process of cancer. So then I went to Cold Spring Harbor for uh, three years, mm -hmm. uh, became a staff member there at Cold Spring Harbor. and. Uh, at Cold Spring Harbor, I collaborated with Joe Sandbrook, uh, a really very accomplished virologist. I was sort of the chemist nucleic mm -hmm. acid, and he was sort of the virologist. We had lots of fun, did some very nice experiments. And I went then on the job market to move back to a university. I wanted to be in a university of students and chemistry faculty and physics faculty. And so I looked for a position, and then in 1974, uh, I was offered a position at MIT in the Center for Cancer Research. So uh, I've spent my career at MIT now. This is the 40th year I've been a faculty member at MIT. So you mentioned that you had gone to college to major in chemistry and math. Yes. So where did your interest in those subjects come from? My interest in, in chemistry and math? Um, I came inherent in me. Mm. I am someone who... Uh, you know, looks at something and I measure it. I think of things in a quantitative way. I, since I could mm. remember in school, I've always been uh, good at math. Uh, I was always a student who others turned to to solve problems um, and, and, and learned to enjoy that sort of thing. And uh, it just kept growing, and as I learned more and more about it, I enjoyed it more and more. So I did basically what I, I found pleasure in. And uh, you know, that led me to a, a life in science, which uh, is a highly pleasurable life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree with you on that one, for sure. <laughs> now, you spent a good part of your career working on RNA processing, all right? And I wonder how the, you, you got started in that area. Uh, I got interested in the RNA processing, not RNA processing per se, but mm -hmm. I got interested in RNA when I was at Caltech and then moved to Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and it seemed puzzling to me that there was this long RNA that appears in the nucleus of a cell and short RNA in the cytoplasm. And Jim Darnell and others mm. had characterized those RNA relationships 
But at that stage, you couldn't say anything about what the RNAs were because this was before we could, you know, purify DNA even right. and, and, and do microscopy with it. So um, it was a puzzle. And then there was all this DNA in our cells. And we, did, we knew there was, shouldn't have been that many genes. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of DNA. And we had this long RNA. And it was a big puzzle. And it suggested to me that, uh, that maybe gene structure is different in our cells. And because DNA tumor viruses showed this long RNA, short RNA relationship between nuclear RNA and cytoplasm, I thought I could answer that problem then mm -hmm. by doing pretty conventional molecular biology on right. tumor viruses. And that was something, that was part of why I went to Cold Spring Harbor to, to, uh, to learn how to handle tumor viruses. Well, it turned out to be a, a great question to ask because with the um, characterization of the structure of the RNA, I was able to find the split gene structure, you mm -hmm. know, that, that RNA is synthesized in uh, human cells by the RNA splicing process where the pieces of RNA are, are stitched mm -hmm. together, are spliced together. And uh, that was just a phenomenal discovery. I mean, it was just uh, amazing. And uh, that led me into the interest in RNA processing because there I had the intron, there I had the exon. Then the question was, how did all of that happen? Mm -hmm. So that launched me into the RNA processing. So I, I wasn't an RNA biologist, but I became an RNA mm -hmm. biologist because that's where the science led me. Right. I remember I was a graduate student at that time, and Peter Palazzi, my advisor, had just gone to a meeting. He heard you speak, and he came back, and he said, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is splicing, he calls it, and it's just the most amazing thing. It's the future. <laughs> Peter was right. <laughs> Can you remember the key experiment that led you to find splicing? Uh, yes, it was a, a series of experiments that uh, Sue Burgett mm -hmm. primarily led and, and Claire Moore uh, participated in, uh, importantly. Um, we were looking, I had with... Uh, Jane Flint, mm -hmm. we had uh, identified uh, many messenger RNAs from the adenovirus genome, and we had identified that in the nucleus of a cell, of the adeno-infected cell, there was this very long genomic length RNA. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were investigating the relationship, and Jane left to go to Cold Spring, I mean, to Princeton, where mm -hmm. she spent her, her career. Uh, Sue. Uh, was mapping the major messenger RNA from the adenovirus genome, the hexon RNA, and uh, this found or recognized that the five prime end of that RNA wouldn't you know, anneal like we thought it should to the genome. It kept sticking out like a finger. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took us a long time to convince ourselves that that was real. But as soon as we did that, then we started looking for where those sequences were from. and. They came from upstream in, in the viral genome and those three loops that is the sort of our electron microscopy classic structure that shows mm -hmm. exon one to exon two to exon three to the bottom of the right. body of the message was then, uh, we saw it in the electron microscope and we knew that the answer was these long RNAs are being generated and pieces are being spliced out to make that mature message. And uh, you know, that was so stunning that you know, we, we started publishing it. Cold Spring Harbor published uh, in, in parallel the same type of, of observation. And all around the world, everybody who was interested in molecular and cell biology within two months mm -hmm. knew about splicing. Splicing was old hat in two months. <laughs> it was an old tale because when everyone looked in their, in their notebooks, and looked in their experiments, there it was. Mm -hmm. They had evidence in their lab that splicing was real. And they couldn't explain it. They actually didn't you know, report it, didn't describe it. But as soon as they thought about it, yeah. oh, that explains this. And so there was just a lot of confirmation that appeared within a few months of, of the time uh, 
that the, the, the paper was published. And it was found not only in other viruses, but in cellular it genomes. It was found in cellular genomes. It was found in other viruses. It, it's a uh, almost, well, almost a universal right. uh, process in the expression of genes in, in uh, uh, human cells. With the exception of some viruses, which don't splice many of their RNAs. And some viruses don't splice, but they generally can turn that against the cell yeah. <laughs> and right. inhibit splicing and favor their own, right. their own right. RNA. So they play on splicing, but by a negative in terms of uh, uh, the process. Can you give us a, a sense for where that discovery led your lab in, in terms of studying RNA up to the present even? Well, uh, the first thing it, it indicated to me was there had to be some elaborate process. We didn't know if it was elaborate or simple. There had to be some process that would splice out these introns. Mm -hmm. And um, Joan Stites, who was down at Yale at the time, and had um, looked at the sequence of U1, which is a small nuclear RNA, a very abundant small nuclear RNA, and recognized that the sequence at the five prime end of U1 was complementary to the sequence that appears at the five prime splice site. Mm -hmm. So she made the hypothesis that that sequence pairing was important in splicing. And there was lots of inference experiments that um, happened after that. But it took several years before we got a biochemical extract mm -hmm. that we could carry out splicing in. And as soon as we did, then we discovered the Lariat Intermediate, mm -hmm. and Tom Maniatis and, and my lab in parallel made observations of, about the Lariat Intermediate. Once you saw the Lariat Intermediate, you knew that the two pieces of RNA had to be held together. Mm -hmm. So we went looking for the spliceosome, and uh, Paula Grabowski, uh, and, uh, my, and then John Abel, Paula Grabowski in my lab, uh, she's now out of Pitt, Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, and then John Abelson on the West Coast both described the spliceosome as this, you know, 30-40s sedimenting structure. And then I spent uh, really exciting years uh, working out the assembly of the spliceosome and how, how that whole process works. And that spliceosome cycle is in mm -hmm. most textbooks, and I'm sure it's in your textbooks certainly too. It certainly is. And uh, it's become uh, an integral part of how we understand the, the expression of genes. And we now know, as we did when we were looking at adenovirus, that most genes are alternatively spliced, mm -hmm. where the same precursor RNA can be processed along one pathway to make one protein and along another pathway to make another protein. So this whole dynamic of splicing allows our cells to have 23,000 genes, but make hundreds of thousands of different proteins mm -hmm. by using different exons to make different uh, mature proteins. So that, you know, we're still struggling with mm -hmm. how to uh, look at, in a systems way, what proteins in a cell determine what splicing pattern mm -hmm. a gene is expressed by. And just to be clear, that in some cell types, like a neuron, a gene will be spliced along one way and make one protein, mm -hmm. and then other cell types, like a bone cell, it'll be spliced along another pathway to make a different protein. There'll be related proteins, but they're different and can be importantly different. And so all of that cell-to-cell -cell difference has got to be explained by a system of, of proteins and factors that control the splicing. So it seems to me that the splicing story isn't finished. There's plenty more to, to oh, understand. The splicing story isn't finished. In fact, it is only now beginning to be possible to place this control of splicing in the context of all the messages mm -hmm. within the cell, right? So you've got 23,000 genes, and they're spliced in a whole variety of different ways. And what you need to know is within one cell, what set of messages is spliced one way? Mm -hmm. And then another cell, what set it, are spliced another way, and then relate that to the proteins that are expressed in that cell. Right. And all that systems biology is really, we're only scratching the surface of. Mm -hmm. We have not been able to get deep in it. That's one of the things I'm working on in the laboratory, but um, it'll be decades and generations of people who will be 
uh, making that a, a systems way of understanding uh, this very important process. It turns out that 25% that of all the mutations that cause disease mm -hmm. in humans affects this splicing process. Phil, can you look back at all the years you've done experiments and tell us how technology has changed in that time? Technology has uh, really dramatically changed and it's changed over the last 10 years. So um, the technology that occurred in the 70s was recombinant technology, how to break DNA into pieces, mm -hmm joined DNA together to make recombinant DNA, and that gave rise to the whole biotech industry, the ability to make a gene and then express a gene in a cell and make new pharmaceuticals and new drugs and all that totally was the dominating technology. That was the new technology when you were, you were a fellow uh, at MIT. And there were a group of people who didn't adapt to that new technology as scientists, and they basically, over the next 10, 15 years, got in interested. And then there was a group of people who stepped up and did, and they then produced a lot of new and interesting science. Well, we're in another revolution of the same type, and that's a revolution of the, the genomics, being able to sequence RNA at very deep levels mm -hmm. and look at all the RNA sequences produced in the cell and we're discovering you know, really new processes, uh, processes such as non-coding RNAs and, and micro-RNAs and pi-RNAs. And, and then we're also able to see all the splicing patterns that are different and all the different changes in gene expression. And then we link that to chromosomes by you know, the immunoprecipitating out transcription factors bound to DNA, and we're able to get a picture of cell biology at a, at a very core level, at the level of the chromosome and then the expression of the chromosome. Mm -hmm. And that is leading us to a holistic systems view of the cell in which we put viruses and then see mm -hmm. how the viruses change the cell. And uh, that's a, a real revolution. And then it's just coming one on top of another. I mean. It, there's a revolution of being able to look at the proteins with proteomics. And there's a, a revolution of being able to engineer chromosomes much more mm -hmm. rapidly with CRISPR technology. And I think that's an, a very informative example because look at CRISPR technology, a technology that we can now cut chromosomes and piece them together in cells, make mutations by will in very complicated organisms. And where did that come from? It came from sequencing the genome of a bacteria. Mm -hmm. So we look at a genome of a bacteria and say, oh, that system must be cutting DNA. Pull it out, express it in a, in a cell, mm -hmm. and now we can engineer cells, and we can engineer plants, and we can engineer an, an enormous number of organisms. Because it tells you, once you start looking in a biological systems, among biological systems, at their genome structure, you're going to find new functions that you can then synthetically build on in making new, new processes, new organisms. So we're in a, a time in which uh, we're assembling so remarkable sets of tools to change biology and in essence change it both in our understanding but as well in uh, it taking on a more synthetic capacity of being able to make organisms that will make more food Mm -hmm. organisms that will make fine chemicals, organisms that will use biomass to make fuels. So we're moving from a chemical-based industry to a bio-based industry, biochemicals, mm -hmm. by this ability to manipulate and control organisms. And if we're ever going to get control, and we have to, of climate change and CO2 use, these types of processes are going to be at the core of that happening. You know, it's interesting, when I was in Cambridge, there was a debate about recombinant DNA, DNA. <laughs> and now these new methods that you're referring to engender another debate, another ethical kind of debate, right? Uh, they're engendering many ethical types of debates. Uh, there's always the debate of how much human engineering one should think about. I'm not a big proponent of that. 
Uh, but then, you know, plants and mm. GMOs. Uh, I'm very pro-GMO. And the reason for that is that I don't think we're going to be able to feed the 9 billion people that are going to be on Earth mm. mid-century if we don't increase food capacity. Not only, you know, intense agriculture, but making plants that will grow with high salinity in the salt in the soil where you can't grow plants now, making plants that yield more with less water. And these are, th I mean, we're gonna start people if we don't do that. Yeah. Hopefully we'll gain with more education control of the population and populations will decrease and we won't find that you know, intense pressure. But mid-century, we're gonna have an enormous pressure on, on quality of life and food production and water. Uh, yep. without question. It, it, we're, it's almost inevitable. So Phil, of all the things you've done in science, is there any one accomplishment that you think has contributed the most to the field compared to everything else? Um, it's a hard question to answer. And the, the story is not over. <laughs> okay, so uh, clearly the discovery of split genes was the high point of my intellectual contribution to, mm -hmm. to science. Uh, uh, there's no question about it. Um, the students I've trained have made remarkable contributions. I feel enormously gratified by them. And I, I I'll just pull one out as an example. Andy Fire, who was a graduate student in my lab, uh, was a discoverer of RNA interference and got a Nobel Prize for the discovery of RNA interference. Uh, but we haven't talked about, you know, I s was among uh, a group of scientists in 1978 that started Biogen. You know, Biogen is the th oldest freestanding biotech company now. Gen Genentech was started before Biogen um, and Cetus, but both of them have been acquired. Uh, Biogen is the major therapeutic for multiple sclerosis. It created the intellectual property for hepatitis B vaccine. Almost everybody on earth was, mm. uh, has been vaccinated with hepatitis B vaccine, or many. Uh, it isolated alpha interferon, which is the, and developed it as a, an activity, and it's the major treatment for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and a whole host of other diseases. And beta is what controls multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis. So, through that activity, and I was on the board of Biogen for 29 years, through that activity, I've touched a lot of people's lives. And, you know, we did, uh, after Andy Farr and Craig Mello discovered RNAi, uh, we set out to do some biochemistry there, and mm -hmm. we, in this case, is Tom Tushel, Phil Zamor, and David Martell and myself. So we developed a biochemical system Small saw small RNAs in that system, siRNA, small interfering RNA. Um, then we started a company called Anilum in mm -hmm. 2002. Uh, it's uh, now 10 years old. Uh, I, we are developing a whole new mode of therapeutics based on RNA. Uh, we clearly are able to treat diseases that are centered in the liver in a very effective way, sub-Q, mm -hmm. once a month administration. If this continues, that actually may be as important a contribution of anything I've done in science because we're likely to be able to expand ways of therapeutically treating diseases based on the sequence of a gene. You give me a gene, I make an RNA, mm -hmm. I deliver the RNA, I treat the disease. And that's a whole new paradigm for disease treatment. So um, as I said, uh, it, 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 I can't, I can't even conceive of a more exciting life. <laughs> I was just going to say, you've had an incredible career. I can't even conceive of a more exciting life. So I, I'm almost wiggling sitting here thinking about it. <laughs> and uh, so I've been incredibly fortunate. But uh, I think those are the sort of high points uh, of, of my scientific career. Mm -hmm. I've, I've taught students at MIT and 
and been a you know department chair and and head of a cancer center and started a neuroscience center at MIT, the McGovern Institute, because I wanted MIT to be stronger in neuroscience. So uh, I've just uh, had an extraordinary amount of fun. Now, following up on that, here's one. If you weren't a scientist, what do you think you would have been? Uh, that's a very difficult question because um, I came from, as I told you, uh, a small farming Mm -hmm. uh, uh, community when I grew up in, in Kentucky. Um, and I knew I wanted to not be a farmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? uh, it wasn't uh, interesting enough to me. Um, so I might have made a good school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably would have been in business somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, life molds you. Uh, and opportunities... Uh, that you take uh, change your life, change the course of your life. Uh, the one thing I would say to most young students is that they don't take enough risk in their careers. They take mm. the, the well-trotted road instead of the road that they could possibly be successful at, but don't know and it's unsure and they have to really put themselves in a vulnerable position to, to mm. try that road. But that's where the, the real sweetness is, being able to, uh, to you know, do something new and different. It changes you. It opens new opportunities. Frequently, you can't see those opportunities until you made that step. Right. And uh, that makes uh, all the difference in where you can go in your career. That was actually going to be my last question about some advice for the students reading this book, so maybe I could follow up with how important are mentors in a career and how do you identify the right ones? Um, mentors are incredibly important. All along my career, I have developed relationships with mentors. Uh, I take developing relationships with mentors very seriously because I have learned that it's, re it's very important to get advice from people who've had more experience in life than mm -hmm. you. So, you know, when I was in school, the math teacher was someone uh, who took special interest in me, and I took special interest in math and, and uh, that person. And then when I went to college, there was a, a chemistry professor who took a special interest in mm -hmm. me, I, and I, you know, took three or four courses from him, and I was a TA for his courses. I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, I went to Illinois. I got mentored by Victor Bloomfield, who was my PhD mentor, but lots of people in the, in the community uh, knew me, offered me advice if I went to them. Uh, and then I, I you know, was fortunate enough that Norman Davison, who was at Caltech, a professor, mm -hmm. a, a wonderful, accomplished scientist, um, accepted me in his lab. Uh, I chose him because I read his papers and I said, I would like to write this type of paper. <laughs> I'd like to think this away and mm. learn how to do it better. And so he, he was, it was, I was good, lucky enough he accepted me and then I went and worked with him and I learned a lot. But Jerry Vinograd was a colleague there. I learned a lot from Jerry Vinograd. I had lots of collaborators around me who were still friends. You know, mm. Ron Davis taught me how to do electron microscopy, professor at Stanford. Uh, Ming Chu was a grad student who worked with me. He's in Taiwan now. He's a dean of a medical school. Uh, just a whole host of people that are, mm. that are very close to me. And then I went to Cold Spring Harbor, and Joe Sandbrook was a collaborator, and Joe was a very uh, talented uh, virologist. Um, and then Jim Watson was on paper my mentor, and he gave me advice. And then came to MIT, and, and Salvador Luria was the head of the cancer center, mm -hmm. and he clearly supported me, but the person who was really most important as a mentor was Dave Baltimore, who you worked with. Mm -hmm. And Dave was a very busy person, as you know, but if I needed advice, Dave's door was open. And uh, I went to see him from time to time, when I had a big problem, mm -hmm. 
are a big question. I went to talk to David. And for example, in the discovery of RNA splicing and the split genes, the first person I described that science to was Dave Olimar because I wanted his advice as to what he thought about it, what questions would be his, his mm -hmm. questions for that. So, you know, Sue Bergen and I brought him in and laid out the science for him. And he had some very uh, thoughtful suggestions about it. So we, you know, I've, and I've reached back, you know, even years and decades later, I will call and say, you know, I've been offered a position at X. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about doing Y. And you, mm -hmm. know, you call and you sit down and they know you and they know what you've done and they, they, they have an interest in you, mm -hmm. right? And you have an interest in them. And their advice is they don't have a, an ax in the, in the fire. So right, they, right. their advice is I'm thinking of you and science and what society is about. Let me talk to you about it that way. Let me ask you what you want to do. And that's a very important question for somebody to ask. I've been speaking with Professor Phil Sharp of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thanks so much for talking with me today, Phil. Thank you, Vince. Great.